Hello. Born to the Dark is the central volume of my trilogy. Dominic Sheldrake and his friend Roberta, Bobby, are now in their forties, and they're still up against Christian Noble, the occultist from the first volume, and his grown-up daughter Tina, and his grandson Toff. The Nobles appear to be running an occult meditative experience uh, out in the wilds of Lancashire, which Dominic and Roberta are investigating. We join them at the beginning of the session. Noble paced to a mattress halfway down the left-hand row. Perhaps his speed was designed not to disturb the children, but it looked as ritualistic as a priest's walk down the aisle of a church. His place was opposite Tina's across the room, while Toff lay at the other end of my row, the four of us marking up the corners of a parallelogram. Toff raised his head so nearly vertical that I wondered how his neck could bear it. Go like us, Dominic Sheldrake, he said. Like me, Dom, Bobby said, and shut the door behind me as a prelude to tiptoeing between two ranks of supine children to the nearest empty mattress some way along the left-hand wall. As she sank onto it, she had to support herself with one arm, and I found her clumsiness unexpectedly reassuring. At least she hadn't acquired the unnatural gracefulness the nobles displayed, Toff in particular. Once she was seated, she raised a fist towards me and shook it slowly twice, our old code for the tremendous three. I remembered our adolescent vow and Jim's that we'd always be friends and look out for one another, and was dismayed to think that while she'd looked out for me, I was failing her. Though my son had to come first, I felt worse than guilty. She gazed so steadily at me that I thought she'd sensed my doubts until she said, We have to lie down. The sight of Toff had made me loath to do so. The sight of his face, almost as pale and smooth as a new memorial, raised towards me like a stone at the end of the mound of the rest of him. I couldn't delay any longer in case I attracted more scrutiny, and I fell to my knees on the mattress before lowering myself onto my side and then turning onto my back. I stretched my limbs wide in the approved pose, wishing I could touch Toby's hand, but all the mattresses were too far apart for any contact of the kind. "'We have to close our eyes, Dom,' Bobby said. "'If everyone's but mine was shut, how would anybody know if mine were? Surely keeping them open would help me resist whatever the nobles might do. Perhaps if I kept them practically shut, nobody who looked to make sure I'd obeyed would notice.' I'd left them open just enough to clap through a sliver of sunlight, which appeared to be flickering with nervousness, when Toff said, All eyes. All eyes, Tina Noble and her father said in unison, and I felt as if they were communicating. All eyes, Tina Noble and her father said in unison, and I felt as if they were confirming the child's command. From their voices I could tell that all three nobles were wholly supine, and might have concluded that none of them could be aware of my roots, but I had an uneasy sense that one or more of them had found me out. I let my eyelids sag shut, and Toff spoke at once. Our lullaby, he said. I heard a faint but widespread noise that I wasn't sure I understood. Quite a number of the children had shifted on their mattresses, but I couldn't judge whether they were preparing to sleep or betraying some other form of anticipation. When I risked a sideways glance at Toby, he appeared not to have moved. I was so wary that I shut my eyes tight at once, and Toff said, The words. At first I didn't know if I was hearing a response, and then I made out a whisper. It seemed to be rising all over the room, though I couldn't judge how many voices were involved. Deoloth! Deoloth! It was the name I'd read in Christian Noble's journal, and heard him speak in the Trinity Church of the Spirit. But each time it was repeated, I had the impression that it had grown less defined, as if to help it infiltrate the whole of me. It was intensifying my awareness of my posture, of my outflung limbs that made my body feel as though it was yearning for the sky, or for a dream. I fancied that the whisper was growing more remote, and perhaps this meant I'd entered a dream, because I saw the cloudless sky overhead. How could I see it except in a dream, when I was still in the sleeping room? In fact, it was darker than ever within my eyelids, and the last of the whispered chant merged with that darkness. It was so dark that I wanted to open my eyes to reassure myself with just a glimpse of the room, but I'd lost the ability to open them, unless I'd forgotten how to do so. No, I had no eyes to open. I'd left them, along with the rest of my body, far below me, and now I was out in the vast dark, beyond the sky I'd seen. Even if I'd anticipated some experience of the kind, shouldn't I have felt considerably more terrified and helpless than I did? 
I had to assume that the chant had lulled and not hypnotised me, as well as enticing me out of myself. Perhaps the spectacle of the infinite night between the worlds and stars inspired so much awe that it passed beyond terror. Above all, I felt safe, because I seemed to be merely an observer, as if I were sharing someone else's dream. Surely I can blame the ritual more than myself for robbing me of thoughts I should have had. I was more than glad to find it wasn't entirely dark. The shock of inhabiting the void must have limited my senses until they were ready to venture widely. I saw I was surrounded by distant lights, though the closest objects had no illumination of their own. For a moment, if time had any significance out here, a world as ruddy as this dying coal looked close enough to visit, and then it was left far behind. Further still across the black abyss, I saw a planet I knew was colossal, although now it was less than a marble composed of storms, and another shrunken globe that was encircled by a prodigy like a faded rainbow made of stone. The outer world grew successively darker, and the last one resembled a ball of black ice, too far removed from the nearest light even to glint. Then it was gone, and there was only the starry void. Except for my sense of sharing a dream, I might not have been equal to the experience. I could have fancied that the void was drawing me onwards, much as a vacuum sucks in air, mindlessly determined to fill itself with whatever was available. Despite the distant presence of a multitude of stars, I felt surrounded by sterile emptiness. The fragments of dead worlds, omens of the crumbling of the universe that wandered it at random, brought no relief. The stars were so remote that they kept most of their light to themselves. Whenever my headlong progress brought me closer to one, I saw how it blazed in absolute silence, which made the whole spectacle resemble a dream more than ever. Galaxy succeeded galaxy, separating into hordes of stars, each star immensely distant from its neighbours. Occasionally I saw a pair of stars that might have drawn together in cosmic companionship, but even their doubled light looked like a vain attempt to fend off the infinite dark. By now I felt as though the void had swallowed time, and began to wonder if my journey was to be as endless as the universe, a prospect I found unexpectedly manageable, possibly even alluring. Helpless awe might have swept away most of my ability to think, though I suspect the ritual had, and I was content to feel both escorted and protected. I'd begun to succumb to a kind of attenuated calm when I saw movement ahead. It was beyond one of the immense spaces that made up most of a cluster of stars. It wasn't a meteor swarm or a comet. It didn't move as they did. It was pale and globular, and appeared to be ranging here and there among the stars. I wondered if it could be an errant planet at the mercy of their gravity, however fanciful this was, and then I saw it veer towards the largest nearby star, too purposefully to be drifting. It put me in mind of a moth, attracted by the light. More grotesquely, a moth's egg that had grown somehow mobile, since the spectacle was just as abnormal. Now I thought the pallid globe was so thoroughly pitted, presumably by meteors, that it looked as decayed as an ancient skull. This had to mean its substance was solid, but it wasn't as firm as the planet ought to be. As the object several times the size of the world I'd left behind approached the star, that side of its circumference began to swell towards the light. It looked eager to borrow the glow. No, it was absorbing the brightness, and as it began to shine with a pallor reminiscent of a light above a marsh, it came dreadfully alive. All over the increasingly gibbous sector that was consuming the light of the star, great holes had begun to gape. Quite a few contained eyes, though the bulging whitish orbs were as pitted as the rest of the deformed sphere. Other holes were mouths of various sizes and shapes, all of which began to work, and then to speak, by no means in unison. I couldn't have been hearing them in any ordinary sense, which made the elaborate chorus of whispers all the more insidious, as though the mass of simultaneous words in an utterly alien language was penetrating my essence. I had the unnerving notion that I might grasp them before I consciously understood them, or else they would grasp me. The colossal pallid sphere had started ro to rotate with a terrible deliberation, as though to bathe its entire surface in the starlight it was feasting upon, and my unnatural composure faltered. All at once I dreaded being seen. Surely I didn't panic. How could I be noticed when I was unable to distinguish even a trace of myself? 
the ponderous rotation of the relentlessly vociferous mass was about to confront me with a number of the sluggish, puck-bucked, whitish eyes, which might mean I would glimpse the kind of consciousness that lived in them. Surely, if anyone caught their attention, my escorts would instead of me. And at once I was appalled by realising who that had to include. My son and the other children. <laughs>